Remember when we all used to say, oh my god, there's so much good TV to watch, if only I had like months to do nothing but catch up on it? Well, guess what, Mimi? We did. And as of this recording in early December 2020, we're still stuck at home. So how did that TV binging work out for you? Honestly, I still haven't made it through most of my TV pandemic bucket list. And that's partially because there's so much good new stuff coming out seemingly every week. As bad as this year has been, imagine how much worse it could have been if we were not living in the golden age of streaming television. What's going on in the world is and continues to be awful, but this year also saw some incredibly good television. And we are going to tell you all about the series that got us through it. Welcome to the Great Pop Culture Debate's Best of 2020 TV Special. He thought The Queen's Gambit was about RuPaul's Drag Race contestants doing X-Men cosplay. I'm your host, Eric Resniak. <laughs> Solving mysteries in seersucker chic, it's Ama Marfo. I've got the talking ham, so let's get this going. Let's do it. The British royal family's press secretary is asking that she come with a content warning. It's Kate Rakulia. We are not amused. Mm. And microdosing his way through the pandemic, just like Christine Baranski in The Good Fight, it's Kevin Dillon. Oh, my queen Christine. She will be talked about today, so I'm so excited. Our best of 2020 episodes will be a little bit different from what we're used to. There's no polls, no brackets. There's barely even any debating. Our panelists are just going to go over their top five picks of the series of the year. It's kind of like a pop culture show and tell. If you would disagree with some of our picks or want to add some of your own, please feel free to head to pop, greatpopculturedebate.com and leave a comment on this episode or find us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook and tell us what you think. So we are going to get into our top fives now, and I'm going to start it off with Ama. What is your number five? pick my number five pick is never have i ever from netflix it is a really great return to form for mindy kaling i think um i was thinking about four weddings and a funeral the other day Mm. which i wanted so badly to love and just couldn't do it um whereas with never have i ever i was kind of bought in from the beginning i think it's a good spiritual prequel to the mindy project in the sense that it is that younger version of a character who is in a lot of ways unlikable but also still really learning things about herself through friends and other people around her it was sweet it was really funny um matre ramakrishnan who famously came in from like a social media casting call um is fantastic she is making a lot of best of 2020 lists for good reason Um, And the cast around her is just so much fun. So I really, really liked that. It was familiar and it was comfortable. Um, I think there's a good theme to the ones that I picked in the sense that this was a year where you needed things that felt comforting. So I actually don't have a lot of drama on my list. Um, And never have I ever just really had that. It had conflict. It had things that you didn't expect. But at the end of it, it was just a very warm, fun experience. And I'm so excited that they are just now getting into production for more. I also love that show. It was in my top 10. Like there is a a moment in the last episode where my body made a noise that was like half sobbing, half laughing. And the only other time I've ever made that sound was the Sleep No More episode of the last season of Broad City. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) It is just a very... So that Sleep No More scene is one of my favorite comedic moments ever. Oh my God. I got to watch that like at a screening <laughs> oh. where Abby and Alana were there. Oh and, my like, God. Yeah, just noises. It's so <laughs> funny. Yes. But it is. It's it's that kind of funny where it's just, you've got all of these emotions. Yes. But also it's so, so funny mm-hmm. that your body just makes a apparently heretofore unnamed yes, sound. Just like a sound. <laughs> and I and I just like it's it's a great show. And it was the first of I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm getting off track. I'm getting off track. I'll I'll come back later. <laughs> but yeah, it was yeah, yeah. fantastic. It really was. Awesome. It it was one of the it was the first show that I um did Netflix party with with a friend. Ah. Uh, and we and we watched uh through the pandemic and we watched, I think we watched I want to say five, maybe six episodes, uh, together. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, we just were like, it was, it was just so fun to just like engage and watch in that space. Mm -hmm. Like it really loved, loved this show a lot. It was on my top 10 as well. And it's just, it's just simply fantastic. Yeah. It's wonderful. Uh, 
I will pick up, I agree with Amma saying about the, you needed comfort this year for sure. And for me, that's trash. And so um, <laughs> I, I have recently rediscovered Hoarders. That's not going to make my top 10, but that that is comforting for me. But in a different type of trash, I'm going to call out Real Housewives of Salt Lake City um, with the caveat that it is new. Like I think four episodes have aired thus far. And so if this could all crash and burn within the next you know, eight or so weeks. But thus far, I'm going to say that it is one of the strongest launches that the Housewives franchise has had in quite some time. Um, I think the only one that could possibly live up to is Potomac, but uh, even that had a rough first season. I think it might be going back to Beverly Hills. Um, For me, and Kevin has also watched the show, I think a Midwestern entry into the Housewives franchise is long overdue, and I think picking Salt Lake City was brilliant because uh, you get an undercurrent for this entire show so far is religion and the hypocrisy involved in it in modern times. Mm. And it's not just Mormons, although that is a big chunk of it, as you would imagine it being mm-hmm. Salt Lake City, but there's also a Jewish cast member, a Muslim cast member, and a Pentecostal preacher who is, spoiler, married to her step-grandfather. And so um, there's a lot here. <laughs> the lot here. Um, the casting is, is, I think, really, really solid. Uh, these women are unabashed in their desperation for fame and they are thirsty for attention. And um, (laughs) that's what I want out of my real, my reality TV stars. Um, They're trying too hard. Uh, Most of them with the exception of Meredith, who to me is like a cautionary tale, but most of them, like when the drama starts flying, they're in it. And that's, that's what I need. That's what I need. Ladies. (laughs) I, I need to watch rich people tearing at each other on my television screen. That is how I'm getting through this pandemic. And I'm very hoping that season one can maintain this current level of engagement with me. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Kate, unless Kevin, did you have any thoughts on that? I'll just quickly echo. Like, I think it is really engaging and entertaining right from the bat. And I think that's very hard to do with a reality show where you're setting the stage where you still, where you get to meet to get to know people. Um, I also will give credit to their publicity for that. They did a good job of like, getting you up the roller coaster. So you got to, before you got on the ride, like you know, you kind of knew a little bit about these women um, and they teased the step grandfather thing very well. And that was yes. like a hook to get people in. So it was very good or it has been very good. Has been very good. Uh, Kate, what about you? What's your number five? So my number five is McMillions, um, which uh, when everyone else was watching Tiger King at the start of the lockdown, I was like, but the tigers <laughs> and I watched McMillions instead um, cuz you're bougie. I, Let's just say but it. The t- well, let me and let me also say real quick for Tiger Kate, I'm from Tampa, so like that wasn't really the spectacle that everybody else thought it was. So I was like, I can't watch this. That's just going back home and no thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was it was so it was not I don't talk about being from Tampa as much anymore. It's a problem now where it didn't really <laughs> used to be, but Kate, I'm I'm affirming your decision. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um so yeah, McMillions is a true crime HBO documentary about this brazen unbelievably complicated fraud scam to fix the McDonald's Monopoly game. Um, for basically a decade from 1989 to 2001, there were no legitimate winners of the McDonald's Monopoly game, which was if oh, you were wow. right, <laughs> right. If you were, wow. if you were a teenager in you know the nineties, they would be like little Monopoly cards stuck on all your drinks and your fries and all this stuff. And so it's, I forget how many parts it is, but it, every episode kind of, you meet this new character literal human character that you just didn't anticipate would somehow be involved in this incredibly byzantine scheme um it has these wild characters it has an early aughts nostalgia it's this wild systemic fraud that is there's a lot of pathos in it this thing this sort of like strange fluky thing you know changed a lot of lives ruined a lot of lives it gets into the mob maybe question mark <laughs> like it's definitely it's really um you know i i my theme of my of my showcase showdown um, is is things that are documentaries or based on real life. And for some reason, that was what I was turning to this year. Maybe my brain was just trying to cling to some idea of an objective reality. I don't know. <laughs> but interesting. But this was a lot of this was a lot of fun. Really interesting. Kind of sad. Um, and no tigers were hurt. 
I, w- I watch McMillions, and I will say that the real shocker moments to me came towards the yes. end, like three quarters of the way through, when you're introduced to the developer. Oh my god, who got involved yes. in this? And I'm sitting there watching that, and I'm like, how is this man not currently in prison? Like, right? There's some right. absolutely like <laughs> moments where, like, when they go to confront their sister in law at the airport. Oh my god! Yeah, clearly they are going to harm her, yeah. and I'm like how is this on my television right now? Like, All right, not having watched this, a developer got involved with Monopoly because that is... That, oh, it's, chef's it's kiss. really fascinating. It's so fascinating. It's yeah. like, and, like, nobody knows about it because they were just about to, like, go to trial um, and September 11th happened. So, like, yeah. the news oh, wow. just got and all went away. Lost. Yeah, yep. I, I do have issues with the documentary. I find that it goes on too it long. Too- and yeah. the, the, the FBI agent, who I believe may be a producer of it, is also... Doug is so smug and and like so pleased with himself but i'm not gonna get critical i'm not gonna get critical i'm not gonna get critical <laughs> we're out already we're, we're past it. it but he is he is we're past it we've done he is it such a particular idea of like an american man with power right yes and like yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that's yep. fair but it is worth watching because the story itself is yeah. fascinating it really is um kevin what about you you're number five my number five is uh lovecraft country um i um if you'll notice i guess i went into heavy drama (laughs) and or shows that went intense shocking um but um i was so the first episode i was like every probably like 10 minutes i was like wait what no it like was this great like horror thriller but also had these like fascinating discussions or comments on on race and racism in the United States um, with a with what eventually becomes like a sci-fi hitch to the show. Um, and the show just really started with a literal explosion. <laughs> um, and it, it is so good. The acting is fantastic. I, I Jonathan Majors, man, that dude, if you have not watched Last Black Man in San Francisco, um, watch that too. But he is so incredible in this show um, and really charismatic. And then <clears throat> Journey Smollett, um, who can be hit or miss for me. I thought she was Agreed. really great in Birds mm-hmm. of Prey, um, but is is really fun in this too. And... Um, you also have Mr. Angela Bassett, but of course he's a great actor on his own court and <laughs> Um, I love that man so much. He is a great, great actor and he has such heart that he brings to the, the show and uh, Michael Kenneth Williams, who was on the wire. I mean, the cast is excellence and Anjanu Ellis. Uh, you have this really, really great, great dynamic cast who are exploring aspects of racial identity through action sci-fi horror elements that came from in some way it came from H.P. Lovecraft's own stories, which they were racist. He was a racist. Boy was uh, he. He was a racist. And so uh they take that and flip the paradigm and and I think they do a really good job of um I will say this and I do want to be I'm not being, it almost lost me in like, I think maybe the second or third episode, but Mm -hmm. beyond one, one tiny loss or flaw in an episode, boy, was it an engaging show. It was really well written. I loved the female empowerment of the show and the way they talk about like black women bringing their communities together and being the keeper of history. And um, I thought that was a really excellent piece. It was it was such a such a strong show and you know it was a show that i loved watching week to week because it really i was like i'm ready for this week's episode i'm so excited to to sit down and watch what crazy shenanigans happen with this group of people and i think it ended i think i think it's coming back i i don't actually know and hbo hasn't made any announcements but um i hope it does i'd like to see more i think there is story to to be had um but i i also think it ended really strongly too so you know if it does what watchman did and sticks to just being a limited series i think that'll be okay um because it's a really good contained story 
Uh, it was also on my top 10. I hope that it comes back. I really hope it does. It ends in a, in a great place for a season two. Um, I, I just want to comment on, first of all, I think in terms of the timing for it, obviously they could not have predicted this, but it was coming out right when we were as a country going through the, the real heat of the the reckoning about racial justice with the protests of this country and watching what was going on in that show and what was going on in the news. I was like, nothing has changed in 70 years. Nothing has changed. And that's really disheartening. Um, but it was good to have it thrown in my face and like, wake up. Um, the female empowerment in that show is amazing. Ruby and Hippolyta to me, no offense to the other characters who are technically the protagonists. <laughs> those were the ones where anytime they got hurt yeah. or they were in peril, I was like, don't you fucking do it. Do not fucking do it. Because those characters to me resonated so intensely. I was in love with them. Um, I, I think this to me is a show that got better as it went along i agree okay. with you that there's there were some moments in like the first four episodes where i was like uh-oh you're losing it you got to get it back um but i thought it finished very strong and to me it's um using this ridiculous magic sci-fi fantasy technology stuff um as this type of storytelling trope to get into real world very real shit um I loved it, and I want to see more. Please bring it back, HBO. I love that show. It, to me, it was one of the most exciting shows of the year. Do anybody yes. else have anything else to say on that? It's in my queue. I want to watch nope. it. <laughs> Please do. I, th yeah, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend. Also on HBO Max. Wink. Seriously, Wink. HBO Max. <laughs> Send your dollars this way. <laughs> I'm going to go back to Ama for her second pick. What do you got? So... As I'm looking at my list now, I am just now realizing this is the only returning show on my list, which is a feat, frankly, because again, going back to that idea of comfort, I was rewatching things that I have already seen most of this time. And um, what we do in the shadows ah! is my number four pick. Fantastic. Yes, it had yes. such a, well, so first of all, the show itself had such a feat to kind of keep pace with the movie, which I loved. Um, I saw the pilot at South by Southwest when they premiered it and was like, there's no way they're going to top this. And then there was an episode in the first season, which I will not spoil if you have not watched it, but you'll know it when you get to it, that I was like, oh, wow, they did it. <laughs> they sure did. And then again, in the second season, they just kept upping it. They got some good distance from the movie. Um, so they have some really interesting things going on. They had to deal with ghosts. They had to deal with um, like other types of supernatural. Vampire hunting was a big piece of it. And in all the chatter that's going around that show this year, you're going to hear about an episode on the run, which is <laughs> spectacular. Um, alter egos. Mark Hamill shows up um, just trying to blur that line between being human and being a vampire. It's so 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 funny everybody's at the top of their game and it has me even more excited for the new season to come out but it's it's coming into its own in such an interesting way um and just it's having so much fun and i'm having so much fun along with it loved it also my top um, 10 loved it loved it loved it it's so funny and so like i'm always so impressed by a show that like will just go for the stupid joke but also is so humane like it's really cares about those stupid awful characters <laughs> and like it does like it really it, does. it's sweet in some very surprising moments yes. and you're just like wow it just it continues to surprise me and mm -hmm. how fun and how smart and how sweet and how interesting it stays yes yeah and the stakes ha vampire pun <laughs> Uh, nice well uh, done Kate. there were a lot of stakes in that finale so many a lot stakes. of stakes in that finale <laughs> Um, is it streaming? Because I I always mean to watch it and I can never find it. Where can Hulu, I start? Hulu. Hulu. It's on. It's on Hulu. Yep. Um, Perfect. it's because I know Hulu has this odd agreement where some things are only on Hulu and some things are both on TV and on Hulu. Um, what we do in the shadows is both, but both seasons are there now. It's an FX Thank thing, you. right? It's FX. Yeah, yeah. FX yeah. on Hulu. Although oddly, I don't know that the movie is streaming anywhere without having to rent it right now sometimes it Correct. is sometimes it isn't at the moment we're recording it is not but if you haven't watched any of it you can start with the movie but you don't necessarily have to okay that's good and, to know and eric if you want there's an app called um real good and it actually tells you where you can self-select we're, we're doing advertising for real good too now <laughs> um you can self-select what streaming services or platforms you use, and it'll narrow down 
you're like, oh, I want to find this TV show in the, from this year. I want to find movies from 20, 2009. What's available? It tells you literally everything. It's fantastic. Is it? That is news you can use. Is it a around. pun yes. or is it is it real good or real good? It's real good and it's called real good and it's real good. No, but <laughs> is it R-E-E or R-E-A? <laughs> Oh, R E E R E E. So it is a pun. It is a pun. Perfect. It is a pun. Yes, it is a pun. Yes. Coffee right. number one is just kicking it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you for that, Ama. And I absolutely will be checking that one so out. Good. Um, for my second pick, I'm gonna go with Star Trek Discovery on CBS All Access. This is the third season. Um, I've always liked this show. It was kind of their their big launch for the all access platform. I feel as though in before this show was really kind of hamstrung for two reasons. Number one, the people who were behind it kept trying to do these big gotcha moments like halfway through a season where everything you know, think you know, you don't know. And it really was hurting, I think, the overall pacing and cast of the show. They, they, they were always kind of boxed in. And then the other number two really logistical issue is this series is set chronologically before any of the other Trek series. It's even before the original 1960s one with Shatner, etc. cetera. Oh. And so it is a beautiful series. It is gorgeous. There are sequences that are absolutely cinema quality. And so you're sitting there watching it and you're like, literally none of this technology is in the original series, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine. And yet all of these characters are happening in that same universe. So what the fuck? They explain it away. And at the end of season two, big spoiler, this ship and its crew are sent nearly 1,000 years into the future. So season three now is way beyond where any of the other previous track shows have gone. And it's really opened the show up in a big way. That's cool. Um, it's very cool. And like, even for all the criticisms I just gave it, season one and two are still really good. Cast is great. Jason Isaacs is in season one. He's awesome. Um, why am I forgetting her name? She's amazing. Uh, as Philippa Giorgio, she's uh, a big deal actress, and I'm completely blanking on her name. Um, bottom line, really solid first two seasons. Three is really when the show is coming into its own. And um, I love the mega arc for this. There's There's several that are going on right now. I we're like more than halfway through the season. I don't even have a whiff of the big like next snap moment that has really plagued the previous two. And um, the big thing is that this is becoming much more of an ensemble now, in my opinion. Um, the various characters are really kind of rising up. The, the bridge crew has been there since like season one and they would never get much attention prior to now. And now they're all really becoming their own characters. And it's wonderful to see. Um, Sonequa Martin-Green plays the main protagonist, Michael Burnham. This is a character that's been divisive in the fandom. She is, and there's very good reasons that this character is very stoic and not terribly dynamic and um, frustrating at times. There's absolutely obvious plot reasons that you will get by episode one why she is the way she is. This season has really allowed her to grow as a character and she's showing us a lot more levels. I've, I've always loved Sonequa Martin-Green in this role. I think she's excellent and it's a very different lead role for a Trek series this season in particular has really allowed her to blossom and I love to see it there's been some really interesting new additions to the cast I'm not entirely sold on one of them yet but if you have any interest in sci-fi any interest in Trek I do recommend Discovery I think at this point Discovery is a better show than Mandalorian but that's a, a you, people can disagree with me on that. I really think it's starting to find its its footing now, and I'm I'm so glad to see it because I think it's a great show and a great concept. Can um, I add, can I ask a question? How you much may how much Star Trek do you need to know? Like, because I've watched like some of things, but I don't really know the universe, so right. I feel like I might be a little at a loss. And would I sure. be? So I don't consider myself a huge Trekkie. I would have sampled. Um, Next Generation and DS9 when I was in the 90s. I certainly have not watched any every episode of either of them. I didn't watch any of Voyager, any of Enterprise, um, and like maybe a couple episodes of the original series. Okay. I am able to understand this and know what's going on. Again, initially it's set prior to even the original series. Um, but if you have a familiarity with Spock, Kirk, the Borg, the Mirror Universe, 
that's like if you even if actually Borg isn't even involved in this yet. But that stuff is all you really need to know. The rest of it, it will teach you. It's a very modern take. And the first season, by the way, was developed and produced by Brian Fuller. Um, and it shows. Nice. And so if you like Fuller shows, give it a shot. Again, there's issues with the first couple seasons, but it is a I think a really solid show that not a lot of people were watching because it's been on the CBS All Access paywall. But because of the pandemic screwing up, screwing up filming schedules, they did show the first season on regular CBS earlier this year, too. So, uh, Kate, I'm going to pass it off to you. So my number four is Babylon Berlin, uh, which has been out for a couple of years on Netflix. Um, it is a co-German uh, Netflix production. Uh, the third season debuted this year. It is not quite as clockwork perfect tight as the first two but it's still babylon berlin so it's still terrific uh so this is a detective noir show set in weimar berlin um it's co-produced by tom tickwer so if you have a sense of him as a director it is very much kind of in that vein it's outrageous oh that's interesting yeah right like i didn't realize that he had anything to do with it and then i watched it and i saw his name and i was like Oh, oh, Oh. (laughs) it's outrageously gorgeous. Just the cinematography, the costumes, the sets like it is. It's not a 10 hour movie. It's a TV show, but (laughs) it looks cinematic Um, because it's noir. Everyone is like lots of feelings and and it's it's also just horny and thirsty as hell. Like it's really a mood. (laughs) And um, but it's also it's very extra. Like it's really um flamboyant and how it sort of tries to portray the feeling of how it must have been felt to live in Weimar Berlin which is sort of you know a society on the edge uh, that's like full of powder and is about to go um and I, I have no idea I know exactly and so like, <laughs> <laughs> you know for a little truth a little connection in the society that's rotting from the inside and about to explode not not a 2020 mood <laughs> right oh also <laughs> it's in German do not watch the subtitled version. So you have to pay attention to it. You have to read it, but it absolutely rewards the attention that you pay. Can you explain what you mean? Like it's in German, yeah. but do not re- watch the subtitled version? Oh, I'm sorry. Version? Yeah. Do not, do not, um, do not watch the dubbed version. That's what I meant. Oh, dubbed yeah, yeah. version. Watch, oh. the, watch German the German version, version with, with the subtitles. Yes. Thank yes. you. That's, that's what I thought you were saying. Well, thank you. That sounds it's very so interesting. Good. Kevin, I'm going to go to you. Your fourth pick. Fourth pick. All right. We are also going for another CBS All Access. Yay. Thanks, Derek Makita, for, <laughs> um, yeah, not saying it. Don't his spot. <laughs> Thanks, Derek Makita. Love you for being um, a great daddy and paying for my CBS All Access. I'll say it that way. Thanks. <laughs> um, um, but The Good Fight. Um, so I was like, okay, we're doing a spinoff of The Good Wife, which is... Um, probably my favorite drama of all time but boy is the good fight you know catching up and i i it's rare for a spinoff to be just as good as the original and if not getting better but this this show follows uh christine baranski's character diane lockhart as she um the way the premise started is is that she's about she retires and then um in a kind of like birdie made off scene type situation she loses all her money the first season of the show is kind of weak um so it you know if you want to get into the show um it 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 follows a character who has actually since left the show uh rose leslie who's a pretty actually boring character um but the the christine baranski character is just great and so in season four it actually starts with a what if hillary won the election episode Um, and it is fascinating. It is a genius. So essentially what the episode actually explores is that, um, uh, with a woman and, and there's a lot to say about this, but with a woman in office, um, the Me Too movement never happened. And so sexual assault survivors have a harder time, um, proving, their stories or like we don't have the investigative aspect of this and it's because well a woman's president so that's not happening anymore um so it's it's this very dark timeline and that's not to say that that would have who knows what would have happened but it's this very misanthropic exploration of um, i guess hillary clinton's america 
um, in a very, you know, interesting way because Diane Lockhart has always been a very pro Hillary person. There's actually a picture on her desk where you see her, you know, shaking fake shaking hands <laughs> with her. Um, I hate those. Those TV shows need to be better at superimposing people into pictures. <laughs> um, Request for 2021. Yes, please, 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 please. Um, but the season itself also um, then in turn follow, like goes down a rabbit hole of um, they are pseudo hired to explore the Epstein case. Um, and it's just this bananas, weird, funny, quirky show um, that is, of course, a legal drama, but explores modern day politics um, it also, um, the, the law firm that they work at Reddick Bozeman, um, and Lockhart is bought by another company. And so they become this like corporatized law firm and it explores, um, I, I'm guessing a trend of law firms being bought by outside companies and then their, their cases and things like that being owned by corporations and the effect that that has on the legal system which is also really, really interesting. Um, and the cast is just really great. It's Christine Baranski, Audra McDonald. Um, oh my God. Delroy, Delroy Lindo, Lindo. Delroy Lindo. Kush Jumbo. Um, the girl who plays, Sarah Steele, who plays Marissa, who's hilarious and brings a lot of levity. Um, it's very well written. And the thing I love about the two most recent seasons uh, is they name their episodes... The third season named their episodes uh, in the same fashion as Friends. So it was like the one (laughs) where blah, 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 blah. And in the fourth season, they named their episodes after uh, It's Always Sunny episodes. So the gang gets a call from HR. That's fascinating. It's incredible. And then there's also an episode where uh, they want to sue a play that uh, is satirizing race in the workplace, kind of a la slave play. Mm -hmm on Broadway and the the person who wrote the play worked at their law firm. And so it's just both very funny and sexy and dramatic. And it's, it is one of, if you can get your hands on CBS all access, you can watch this show without watching seven seasons of the good wife. Um, you do not need to watch that. It is helpful because there are certain threads a little bit, but like you won't really be lost. It's a great, great, great drama. And with that, we are going to press pause on this episode and take a quick break. We will be right back. We are back with the best of 2020 TV. Uh, here are our continuing picks. Uh, Amma, I'm going to give it to you. Your third pick. Okay, so my third pick is Netflix's The Babysitters Club, and this is going to be a little bit of a journey. So stay with me <laughs> on this. Um, I was a massive Babysitters Club fan as a kid. Um, had all of them. My mom gave away my collection no. without consulting me, which is. It's, I am adult enough to not hold it against her, but I have not forgotten. It's a very much forgive but not forget type situation. Mm-hmm. And over the past couple of years, I got very back into a podcast that's two guys. Um, one is in his late 30s, one's in his early 40s, who just read the books for the first time and recap them. Oh my God. Um, so it's a universe I've been living in for like the last four or five years. So when Netflix announced that they were doing a show, I lost my mind. Like, so excited. And it's a really delicate dance, right? Because the world that they were living in in the late 80s when the book started um, is so different from where we are now. And there are all those concerns about like, would this premise even hold up in a society now where there's cell phones and what would the kids be doing and what are they going to be like? Like 13 in 1986 and 13 in 2020 are so different. And it was such a thoughtful, sweet, caring adaptation. Um, It was fantastic like they found ways to kind of explain away some of the things like reasonably explain away some of the things that would have kind of held it up so what you have are just very sweet relationships with kids and their parents um navigating growing up navigating how you kind of come to some of those responsibilities as a babysitter um it was great so and it's one of those things where it dropped july 4th which was the same day that hamilton dropped on disney (laughs) plus 
Mm-hmm. And people were losing their minds over like Hamilton being on Disney Plus. And I was like, I've seen Hamilton. I'm actually going to be watching The Babysitter's Club. It's fine. <laughs> um, so I did that watch by myself. But then I had this wonderful experience thanks to Netflix Party, which has become kind of a saving grace of the pandemic in terms of being able to do things socially. And I talked to friends who had also read it as kids, some who I grew up with, some who didn't, and said, hey, do you want to get together on Saturday mornings and watch it together? So I had a month where every Saturday and Sunday I got to get up and watch it with people in multiple countries, different ages. Some of them watched it with their kids, some didn't. So it became this kind of return to childhood that was really comforting in its own right. And then this beautiful social experience where at the time, um, I do have roommates, but they weren't here at the time. They were quarantining at home. So I was by myself. So being able to share that with so many other people just... It would, it would have hit my list regardless, but I think the way that it dropped and the way that I chose to watch it and then rewatch it also made it just a beautiful experience. But they did such a good job with it. Um, even the adult actors, so Alicia Silverstone plays the mom. There are a couple clueless references in there that are just beautifully done. Um, Mark Feuerstein um, plays Watson, Christie's stepdad. A perennial character actor and should be on everybody's favorite list. Mark Evan Jackson plays um, oh, yes. Marianne Spears' father. And it's so funny because he talked very briefly in one of the Brooklyn Nine-Nine recap podcasts about how he was doing the Babysitter's Club show. Did not say who he was playing. And I went to the podcast group and was like, Mark Evan Jackson's in. Who is he playing? So we're all speculating for like six months. <laughs> I ended up being right. I love being right. And he <laughs> nails it. But yeah, it was just, it wasn't just a good show for the year. It just, it encapsulated a good experience in a year where, man, we needed good things to happen. And this gave it to me. I love that story. That's really sweet. I'm so watching this now, to be honest with you. I have not watched it yet. It's been, it's, it's, it's great. I, and I do really think that you'll like it. It's been on my list too. I was a hardcore babysitter's club person also as a young. Kate, you will love Ugh, it. You yeah. will love it. I, I almost have been saving it for a time when I like, like when it's real dark outside and I just need something to make me feel warm. <laughs> That's smart. Well, look what's here. Yeah. <laughs> knock, knock. Who's at the door? <laughs> Hunger. <Ugh. laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that, Alma. That was lovely. Um, my second pick or th- third pick is Pen15 on Hulu, which um, oh. is wild. <laughs> this is a wild show. Um, I had not watched season one until this year. And so I don't even know what made me find it and watch it. But for those who have not yet watched it, here's the conceit of Pen15. It is two 30-something actresses, Maya Erskine and Anna Conkle. And they have written a teen comedy in which they are playing slightly fictionalized versions of themselves as 13-year-olds in 2000 and they are playing opposite actual 13 year olds so you must remember (laughs) every scene on this show are 30 something women interacting with 13 year olds as though they are peers and it is fucking amazing it's fantastic (laughs) it it is so good uh, like, listen, Anna Conkle's great. I am not at all, like, harping on Anna Conkle. But Maya Erskine, to me, how she has not been nominated for an Emmy for this role, I don't understand. She is fully in this character. Like, I believe she is a 13-year-old girl. The scenes with her and her mom in the tub were so sweet and yet, like, also very funny. The whole thing is is really great. If you like teen comedies, especially ones that are a little more... um. I don't want to say gross, but uh, aggressive. Big Mouth. There, so I just watched season four of Big Mouth. There's an episode where the girl, Pen15 girls are guest characters yeah, yep, yep. in this season of Big Mouth. And there's like those not- great inside jokes about like, oh, and we're in our own show. And I'm like, oh, fuck, that's great. Oh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like if you enjoy Big Mouth, watch Pen15. It's not a, it's not animated. It's a live action comedy. That's why it's as funny as it is. But um, it's it, season two, we only had the first six episodes. The last six are going to drop in 2021. It's a little bit darker and more serious than season one. They're dealing with some pretty major shit, um, but it's great. I, I cannot recommend it highly enough. I eagerly await the back half of season two. And if you have not yet watched it, please rectify that immediately. Yeah. Nah. 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 
it it just edged out of my top 10 and it was it was wonderful but like you said there were pieces of that second season that were like a little bit darker a little bit more uncomfortable like things that I that I identified with to the point that I think someone tweeted like were we supposed to need to go into therapy after that second season I was like honestly (laughs) I have some things to work out that I had not really Mm -hmm. thought about until I saw it played out again in somebody else's experience I was like oh wait I'm not over this what do I do um so (laughs) and like it's beautifully done it is I was never a middle school girl but I was like the next best thing and so I have to assume (laughs) that what happens with them resonates very strongly with people who were middle school girls is that fair oh my god yes Yes, like they're um the friend and her name is escaping me now, but the the new girl that comes that becomes their Molly, Molly, Molly. Yeah, oh so God, one of my God. friends that I've known literally since like third grade, um, he's a boy, but he was like, she is the most harrowing villain, and I was like, Nick, you know people like that. We grew up <laughs> with those girls, like you know them. Like he was just, it was just one of those things where like it escaped him. He's like, I can't believe they crafted that villain. I was like, no, those people are real and you knew them. They just didn't treat you that way. Um, it was <laughs> ridiculous. She was diabolical. Like, yeah. I, the, 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 I worried for their safety in that episode. Well, and they didn't really pull at the thread of like, especially with Anna and like how she was being treated or not Anna, sorry, how uh, Maya was being treated and how it was like slightly racially tinged. But I was like, holy uh-huh. shit. Like that's. Yep. That was real. Like that hit me especially hard. And yep. I'm gonna have to work some things out. <laughs> I I interviewed the cinematographer for that show and he talked about how he shot um Molly like um it was Stephen King's The Shining. <laughs> like oh. come play with us. Wow. Like, and that, yep. He was like, that was my influence for her. He's like, Stephen King's The Shining. She's this just like terrifying human being. Um and yeah, I I wanna quickly just say this show, I did not love the first episode of season one. I, it just really, really, I couldn't get into it. And then I got very, very high stoned <laughs> um, and plowed through season one. And I was like, this is mind blowingly great. And then watch season two during the pandemic. It, it's awkward. Just lean into the awkwardness. It's mm-hmm. an incredible show. Incredible. Absolutely. Uh, Kate, your third pick. My third pick is The Great. Um, It's also a real 2020 mood. So The Great is um, a TV show starring Elle Fanning and Nicholas Holt as Catherine the Great and Peter, the emperoress and emperor of Russia, right when Catherine comes over from Austria. Uh, It's written by Tony McNamara based on his play. He also wrote The Favorite. So if you've seen The Favorite, you kind of have a sense of the sort of it's sort of an anachronistic satirical comic treatment of historical events and in the opening of every um episode when you see the great it's like there's like a little asterisk that it's like this is a mostly true story um it is not i mean it is but it is not (laughs) and it is very um really beautifully shot gorgeous sets incredible clothes very lush um but it's it's punctuated by these moments of intense brutality and cruelty. And, you know, that's part of the mechanism of what the show is about, right? It's about pushing for change, staying hopeful, enjoying like sensuality and pleasure in this horrible fucking world. (laughs) Again, not, not a 2020 mood. And um, Elle Fanning is great, but Nicholas Holt as Peter is doing uh Hugh Grant has a baby with Patrick Bateman and it is unbelievable (laughs) (laughs) it's truly unbelievable because he is a stone cold psychopathic monster and you can't stop watching him um it's very funny it's very um there are hard things to watch like there's one of these moments when Catherine comes over of course she's like very into like Voltaire and enlightenment thinking and she gets to Russia and they, they take her to the front to like meet the soldiers. And she's like, would you like a macaron to the soldier? And he's like, I don't have any arms. It's, it's that kind of like, <laughs> like how can this macaron help this man with no arms that your country has like sent to a pointless war? It's a great show. I really liked it. It had been in my sights and I hadn't 
taken the plunge in yet, but like as you're explaining me, it's reminding me a lot of something that I watched a good bit during early uh, quarantine, but didn't have an eligible season for this year, which is Dickinson. Mm, yes. Um, because yeah. the first season came out in November, next season comes out in January. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I love Dickinson. So it actually sounds like one that I'm going to have to add to my list. Yeah, I think you'd really like it because it is very cheeky, very anachronistic, like needle drops, like she blinded me with science in the episode about um, like she's trying to bring enlightenment to the court. So like there's this incredible episode that I won't spoil for you, but it involves a parachute and a Pomeranian. And, and it's not as, I'm in. it's not as dark as you think, but it is still pretty dark. <laughs> well, thank you. You're Kate. welcome. Uh, Kevin, you are up next. What do you got for your third pick? Um, my third pick is uh, another HBO show. Love me some HBO. Uh, and that is Insecure, um, season four of Insecure. Um, this season starts uh, with um, Issa and Molly, who are, are, I would say, are two protagonists in the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a lot of times Molly gets billed as supporting, but they're the two lead characters in the series. And it's the whole season centers on the... Um, their friendship kind of breaking down. Um, They're both at very different places in their lives. And um, you get to explore a whole season of that breakdown in friendship. And it is, of course, both still very funny, but also very heartfelt and explores, you know, Black female friendship in this very interesting and dynamic way. Um, I um, interviewed, actually, Yvonne Orjai for another website that I worked at. And... You know, this show, people, poor Molly, um, a lot of people, the whole season centered around people hating Molly kind of a little bit online, which was a shame because, you know, in hindsight, you think what's interesting about the the show is, is that uh, it explores different layers of what friendship looks like and who you are in friendship. And a lot of the conversation centered around the the ways in which women tackle their friendships versus men. Mm. And the way I think that is one of my favorite pieces, like, the fight that happens between Molly and Issa, I've had that fight with friends and we literally the next day have gone to brunch and been like, Hey, what's going on? We're, and we're good. Whereas this explores the way women kind of emotionally connect to one another and how important their friendships are and the value placed in them. And I think I, I, I don't know that I've seen, uh, female friendship explored this intricately in the way it, it, it build to this over four seasons. We, we are, we were seeing this, you know, over the years, um, we were seeing them kind of separate and go in different directions and explore their own identities. Um, and and you got to see them kind of dissipate and explore new relationships. I also really loved, um, uh, Issa exploring her, um, relationship with Jay, um, and her, her previous love interests in the season, it's just a beautiful, beautifully, sh- I think the show evolved into something so much bigger and more beautiful in its fourth season. Um, I It's st- while still remaining intimate. Um, there's also an episode where, oh my God, what's her name? Kim Fields shows up mm-hmm. and it, it's, it's um, Molly goes on vacation with her boyfriend and Kim Fields play the, plays this like obnoxious divorcee who always keeps showing up while they're traveling. I think they're in Mexico or Hawaii. I can't remember. Um, but she's just this like scene stealing, hilarious person. And I, I really loved that moment for Kim. It was just really funny. Um, and it has Natasha Rothwell, who is also a writer on the show. And she, she wrote one of my um, favorite um episodes of television this year which was Issa and Jay kind of doing this like before sunset in real time exploring they had broke they've been broken up but have been exploring what their relationship might look like and where they can go and they do this walk down an artist alley uh in LA and it's just so beautiful and I I love the the way the show matured in season four um it, it it had taken a downturn in I think in season three was a little bit messier, but I think it needed that season to get to where it is now. And I think it's doing really, really great work. And, you know, finally got nominated for a whole bunch of Emmys, which it was well-deserved. And it's just a fantastically written and directed show um, with some great acting and highly recommend checking that out. 
again, you can go to HBO Max and watch <laughs> all four seasons of Insecure. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love season four. It really it hit hit my heartstrings, made me laugh. It, it's it's a perfect combo of both of those things. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin. And again, HBO Max, give us your money. <laughs> Amma, back to you. Pick number four. So my pick number four is Dicktown, which is actually a short contained within an FXX kind of, not clip show per se, but it's kind of a collection of experimental cartoons uh, called Cake. And Dicktown is a, essentially it's if Encyclopedia Brown grew up, but his clientele didn't change. So it's a guy that like lives in his hometown in North Carolina that solves mysteries for teenagers. And it sounds so weird to explain it that way, but it's got these really familiar pieces of like, if you read the Encyclopedia Brown books, um, a little bit of Scooby-Doo, um, but it's an adult cartoon and it's just so fun and like really sweet and familiar. Um, it was something that I had kind of heard John Hodgman, who I'm a big fan of, talk about a good bit and then hadn't really watched um, and then found out that a friend did voiceover work on it. So being the supportive friend as I am, if you're in a thing, I will watch it. Um, checked it out and it's just so fun and it's like sweet and very silly. Um, they actually did, uh, David and John, who are the creators and writers of it, did a watch along on Instagram Live yesterday that was supposed to go for two hours, went for four. I sat through the whole thing anyway, because <laughs> what is time and what do we have to do? Um, but it's just, they loved making it so much. And you can see that as you watch it. Um, and a lot of other like voice talents that you know come up in it. Paul F. Tompkins pops up, John Benjamin pops up. But it's just this really fun snippet, literally 11 minute episodes of like quirky crime solving by adults like in that same kind of interesting relationship with kids not like pen 15 but that kind of like comes to mind with it um but yeah it's a lot of fun and it's like you can get through the whole series in two hours we did not yesterday but it's perfectly possible <laughs> so i totally recommend it it's on hulu um broken it's within the cake episodes but it's also broken out on its own so you could watch it just on its own but yeah, it was such a nice surprise. Just sweet, comforting. Um, and as came up yesterday on the chat, it holds a spiritual connection with my number one, but I'll come to that when it's time. That's right. Um, I had never heard of this show until you had put it on your top five. And I, I've been to Pound Town many times. But <laughs> time. so I'll have to check that out. Thank you for that recommendation. Um, I appreciate that. It's it's fun. It is not... It, doesn't really hold the same kind of thematic elements as pound town um in fact it's kind of an ongoing joke that one of the characters famously doesn't go there but mm. enjoy Child it anyway. i will i will thank you um on a completely different note but the same platform hulu which had a great year by the way um my number two pick is little fires everywhere which is a mini series uh based on the book of the same name by celeste in am i saying that right Ng. Ng. Kate, Ng. You, yeah. Ng. thank yep. you uh, so, uh, the broad strokes of this, it's Carrie Washington and Reese Witherspoon. It is set in the early to mid nineties in a suburb in, I believe, Connecticut. Uh, the basic gist is Carrie Washington is a artist and the mother of a teen girl who is kind of, uh, I, I don't want to use the word itinerant, but she goes from town to town to just do her art. And, uh, they become embroiled in the orbit of Reese Witherspoon's, um, total wasp uh yuppie family and it ultimately becomes a very fascinating dissection about microaggressions about the reality of what racial politics were during the clinton administration of um suburban despair of uh what's actually going on behind the doors of you know, small town America. And I was so riveted by this, especially once you start getting into the backstories of both of those women, which are so interesting. Um, I was up to like three in the morning finishing this. I could not stop watching it on a work day. Not, not on a weekend. Yes. I could not stop watching it. Love it. Um, it was the ending apparently is significantly different from the book's ending. And people were very upset about that. I was just going to ask if you had read the book. I did not, okay. but I did. Uh, we talked about it significantly in my office book club, and many of them had, and they had issues with the ending of the of the of the show versus the ending of the book. Having only experiences the show, I loved the endings, and I I think especially um, I give huge prop. But first of all, Carrie Washington is incandescent in her rage in this show, as she should be. She is magnificent. She's always good. She's 
great here. And um, Reese Witherspoon is a producer on this, and I give her so much credit because the character she plays is wholly unlikable by the end of this show and there is a scene at in the final episode or maybe it's the penultimate episode between her and her older daughter people accuse reese of being very one note this was range this like i was very impressed by reese but as an actress at the end of this series and i thought it was fantastic also if you're interested in seeing pacey from dawson's creek in his tidy white always yes. who among us is not i ask you who among us is not um so it's a mini series. It's not coming back for season two. Um, it I thought it was great. I I could not recommend it highly enough. Very engaged, and I thought it was thought provoking as well. So that's my number two. Uh, Kate, I'm gonna pass it to you. Uh, my number two, and I these my top two flip back and forth, but I have to be honest. My number two is The Crown. Um, so I watched season one of The Crown, which for anyone who doesn't know is the lightly dramatized fictional it is fiction it's fiction the crown would have me tell you that it is a fictional portrayal of uh the royal family under elizabeth's lifetime during her lifetime i watched the first season i really liked it um just i really enjoy the kind of subgenre of uh recent history made into fictional like fictionalized or or like true crime fictionalized like your american crime story um, the, the queen, the movie where Helen Mirren plays Queen Elizabeth, um, that is about how the Royal family reacts or does not react to Diana's death is low key. Mm. One of my favorite movies <laughs> and is written by the same guy, Peter Morgan, who is the showrunner writer for the crown. So it's just, it's a really interesting genre to me in that it is not, it's kind of historical fiction, but it's kind of a s- historical soap opera also, um, unbelievably beautifully produced anyway i watched the first season i liked it watched a couple episodes in the second season kind of lost the train of thought same for the third season oh yeah fourth season oh my god (laughs) it's like i think that the fourth season because it takes place during the 80s um because thatcherism has so much to say about and trickle down economics and ronald reagan and all that kind of like new conservatism in the 80s has so much to say about what our life is like right now um, and because I was alive for Diana, like I remember not, I did, had no idea she was such a child when they got married. Um, but I, I certainly knew her as a popular figure. I certainly remember her death. Um, so in that way, like the pleasures of the show are a little, um, it's nostalgic, it's voyeuristic. Um, it's just pleasurable in terms of like, it's beautiful the way that it is put together. Um, and there's just something really, um, this season between having Julian Anderson on is Maggie Thatcher. <laughs> just, she's just killing it in every scene she's in. I love it. Um, and, um, oh my gosh, I'm terrible. Emma, I forget her last name. The woman who plays Diana, uh, Emma, Corrin. Emma Corrin, Yeah. There's something about those tensions in the monarchy that that's is the best distillation. I think of what this show has always kind of been trying, or if it was ever trying at all to say about, power specifically women wielding power what kinds of power are available to them um fame family and the gilded cage (laughs) that is the royal family um there's it's i i'm not sure ethically how i feel about watching it but i know Mm. like aesthetically i was absolutely riveted the dramatic irony of knowing what is to come for all of these people is just really, there's something about it that's really um, compelling. So yeah, the crown and it's freaking gorgeous. And the needle drops, they're really fun (laughs) this season more than any other. Yeah. Kate, have you watched the Windsors? No, I have not. So the Windsor, it's interesting to me in terms of watching this dialogue. um, And I don't watch the crown, but like I'm familiar with the dialogue around it um, around like how much of it is real, how much of it is fiction, which of course, a lot of it is fiction. Of course. Of yep. Yep. course it yep. is. So like the idea that they need to like disclaim, but I was like, people can use their heads and figure that out, I think. Sure can. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the thing about the Windsors that I like is it is unabashedly ridiculous. Like it is straight up parody <laughs> of what life is like inside it today. So like it's Will and Kate, uh, Megan and Harry, and... A lot of people, I remember when the Meghan and Harry uh, separation was happening, they're like, I can't wait to see how the crown will cover this. And I was like, I can't wait to see how the Windsors will cover this. And it is <laughs> predictably ridiculous. Um, 
Charles and Camilla are involved, um, Beatrice and Eugenie and their mom, uh, Fergie are involved. And it's just silly. So if, if you have that ethical challenge of like, should I be watching this given how people feel about yeah. it? The Windsors knows it's ridiculous. So you don't even have that conflict. <laughs> I will say uh, the I find the pearl clutching and the this how, we must make sure that people understand this isn't real. I'm like, please, seriously. Um, <laughs> I mean, what exactly? Like, let's go ahead and, and do the math here. What exactly are we objecting to that you think is fake? Did Charles not have an affair with Camilla? Mm-hmm. Is that in any way factually incorrect? No, it is not. Was the queen cold to Diana? Is that in any way factually incorrect? No, it is not. They are saying, well, they weren't blue spruces. They were actually balsam firs. So clearly this is uh, How do you historically notice? inaccurate. You notice they never had a problem with this until this season. Until, until yes, this season. season. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. And in season three, Charles is actually treated very kindly. Charles yep. is great in season three. Everyone loves. It wasn't until now when Charles is a bastard yep. that suddenly the, that uh, the royals are getting involved in this. And I think that is 100% Charles. And I'm sorry, if you object to the world knowing that you are a cad, look at your life and look at your choices. Also, I mean, it's yeah. not that to say is... we didn't already know exactly. it just hadn't been put on Netflix right. before. Like, it hadn't been exactly. dramatized, but the evidence was there. And and I mean, right. the show also, like, it makes me think that the royals are human beings more than anything else yes. has ever done. <laughs> Right. And the thing is, like, they make the point, like, I believe season two ends with the royals inviting the BBC into their home to do that yes. documentary, yes. which Philip pushed yep. in order to humanize mm-hmm. them. That's what this show is yep. doing. Um, it's just they don't like it when their warts are shown. But again, we all knew the warts were yep. there. Right. We see it. There was no question about what happened with Charles, Diana, and with Camilla. Um, Camilla. Yeah. And if anything, the crown has made me more sympathetic towards Charles and Camilla yep. because clearly, like, they were a better and match. And they were all but trapped, right? They were all trapped. They were trapped. Yep. It does it's not a trap. Involve, it's a trap. It does not <laughs> absolve Charles at all of his part in this, and he absolutely needs to be held accountable for that. And I'm, I'm sorry. I think that is utter horseshit that the royals are now all upset about, well, this is not really how it uh, the broad strokes are correct, ma'am. Like, come also, on. Also, there are far Give more abuses and misrepresentations of reality that are occurring in the world right now that I care about correct. a lot more. Yeah. Sure. So, like, sure. grand scheme, I'm not worried about. This. Yes, I'm exactly. Just not about. <laughs> and I, can I can I make a plug for the episode called Favorites? Oh which I think is my hilarious. god! Please. So, so good. good. You know what? If you want to just jump in and watch one app, ep- it is hilarious. It, I was dying laughing. It is about Elizabeth going to all of her four different children because Philip says, well, you have a favorite. And she's like, I do not. <laughs> and he's like, y- y- yes, you do. And she's like, well, who? And he's like, I'm not going to tell you. So she goes and invites each of them to lunch or a different engagement and it is it's so good it's fun it's so fucking funny honestly like i just i cackled a lot <laughs> and that. i also so like perfect. formally i mean a lot of netflix shows have bloat right and the fact that each yes. episode of the crown we sort of know we know the story right so the drama and the interest right. comes in how do you tell it and each episode is a sh- is like a short story right it's like it has a it has an overarching theme it has resonance it has symmetry it has it has all of these sort of pleasurable formal constraints so that at the end of the- a metaphor peter morgan loves a metaphor <laughs> and a symbol ladies I mean, and gentlemen it's, no. it's not always super subtle <laughs> <laughs> the stag, the stag. Like, okay. wandering the around fishing. <laughs> but it's just it's a great show i really really enjoy it I, I do need to ask this question. Do we know, because that final scene did not feel like a season finale to me. Oh. Um, do we know if COVID stopped production? Because to me, if you think back to when season two ended, like that cast kind of got a send off. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that season two ends with the family portrait of that first cast all together. Well, that's how this season ends too, with the portrait, with yeah. the Christmas portrait. It is how yeah. the season ends. Oh, it yeah. is a Christmas So, portrait. and I, I yep. do know, I think I was watching some stuff. I think they had to hurry it up. So they might have just been pressed, okay. but I think it was the number of episodes that they expected. Okay. Yes. I was just curious to know if that impacted it. It just, it it felt to me like 
that's the way we're leaving this entire cast. Because mm-hmm. when it comes back, it's a whole new cast. Yeah. Now. Yep. Yeah. Right. And because, yeah, the very last image is Diana, Diana just like staring into the future. And she's got like six years to live. <laughs> she doesn't know it, but we yeah. do. Like, ugh. Yeah. It's- and I love Emma. I love uh, Emma Corrin so as Diana, but good lord, inject Elizabeth Debicki into me. That woman <laughs> <Yes>! is <laughs> everything. I am so excited for her, Diana. It is gonna be fantastic. Yep. And then, oh my god, I can't. Also, wait. I love a corgi. I, th- I love a corgi. <laughs> How could you yep. not? <laughs> corgi Palooza. All right, Kevin, you're number two. Well, let's continue white supremacy. Um, <laughs> sorry, I hate. Sorry, that's a bad joke. That's a bad joke. Oh, okay. um, my next show is the plot against America. Um, the plot against America is a uh, uh, David Simon who did the Wire um, of the Wire fame, and Ed Burns, the actor. Uh, they were the creators and showrunners and writers um, and director. To the, mm, Scratch the direction piece. I, I think that was actually directed by someone else, but they were the creative forces behind this show. So this is based on a novel um, ass- asserting um, what if FDR lost his third bid for the presidency to uh, Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh was known to be uh, a German uh, and Nazi sympathizer. Um, and... Um, so the, the whole show hinders on um, Lindbergh being elected to the office of president, uh, being elected to the presidency um, uh, during uh, World War II. And he maintains the isolationist stance rather than engaging in war uh, during World War II. Um, and so what it does is it creates, this is, it creates a, a, um, a structure and society within the United States that propagates things that are being done in, uh, in Nazi Germany. Um, and so hard watch in 2020, um, to be honest, obviously I, I watched the first three episodes, uh, when it came out, um, and then took a pause because I knew it was delving deeper into the the, the mistreatment of uh, Jewish Americans, Black Americans, queer folks, although they don't really go into queer identity in the series, but minoritized folks um, in the United States and just like further otherizing them and ghettoizing them and actually sending them to the Midwest to work and live with farmers and then murdering folks and silencing journalists. And like, it felt very almost, it obviously felt too real in 2020. Um, I did finish the show after uh, the, the election um, because I had slivers and glimpses of hope, um, which have been furthered of course. Um, But it's a really, really interesting assessment of, uh, of our political system of of the way um, power and privilege influence folks in systemic government. Um, And then there's this character John Turturro plays, who is a rabbi who sells, who aligns himself with Lindbergh and becomes his spokesman for Jewish folks uh, in the United States, where he kind of further otherizes Jewish communities into these ghettos in the United States in the Midwest, and he um, marries Winona Ryder. My one con of this show is Winona Ryder is actively terrible in it. I, I, I just her performance. It, it she gets better as the series goes on, but it's oh, it's not good. It is, it is not good. And I still love, but I still think this show is, it's utterly brilliant. It's so well written. It's, it's. It ends on, uh, it also changed, like Little Fires Everywhere, it changes the ending of the book um, to make it more, um, I, I don't want to give anything away because I think it's it's a really interesting ending, but it makes it more ambiguous around what's happening in, political, in our political system around an election and mm-hmm. voting, mm-hmm. which was also frightening even still as election results were being tabulated. Mm-hmm. Um, still frightening yeah. now. Mm-hmm. Sure is. It, it basically is about power and the systems we have in place. And 
what we can do to protect. And the, my main takeaway is it's about power and what we can do to protect ourselves as citizens and what we need in our systems. Um, and, and it's just a really, really deep dive into that. And the acting is the, uh, the acting that is good. I will say the shout out to Zoe Kazan, who is utterly incredible. Consistent, in consistently amazing. Oh, love her. Love, love, love her. And, and it's a show that, you know, when I think I definitely highly recommend it, but I would say watch it when you feel that you have the emotional capacity to watch it. Like if you can't sit in this other world where fascism is reigning in America, maybe, maybe hold off, but it is a highly recommended. It is also on HBO max. Funny. I will say that uh, we are currently still living in a, in a world where fascism is, Almost reading in America. So Correct. I'm going to need to get a solid six months into the Biden administration before sure. I, I'm going to need some charges to be filed against yep. some very high ranking <laughs> people before I can really coax myself into something like that. But thank you for sharing, Kevin. Uh, Ama, your number one pick of the year. Go for it. So Ted Lasso on Apple TV. Beautiful, pleasant surprise. I'm not really sure what I was expecting when I first went into it. Um, I mean, I kept hearing that it was great and it's Jason Sudeikis, so why shouldn't it be? Um, He's also uh, a primary writer as well as acting in the lead. And the best way that I could explain it, and I think even this would minimize it, is an odd mix between Major League and Pollyanna, but with soccer, which is a wild explanation. (laughs) That is wild. (laughs) But essentially, yeah, it's, but it, in the process of doing that, like typical fish out of water story, like a guy that coached football has to go coach soccer and they have ties and like overtime is like weird and different and him not understanding the customs and that has its own um, elements and is ripe for comedy in its own right. But there is this kind of central unshakable sweetness to it that I think came along like at the time that we needed it so I think it dropped in like June or July I happened to watch it about a month ago um which is a moment where things were a little bit darker admittedly but it was just powerfully positive and just so so concerned with and so confident in the goodness of people around you even people that have kind of shown themselves to be unlikable or so deeply hurt that they take it out on other people and it's a message that i did not expect from a show whose main character originated from interstitials for nbc sports in like 2013 That's amazing. It just, it's, <laughs> it's such a surprise to figure out i was like i don't really know what this is supposed to be or like what it's really doing And it just manages to find and root out through really funny and really interesting writing the best parts in all of their characters, even if they don't always act on it. And it was just such a fun surprise, like emotional, hilarious. Um, They've already renewed it for seasons two and three, so we know we're getting more. I think they just finished writing season two, but I think in addition to just being a fun watch, it was a pleasant surprise that was just a needed combination of emotions that hit like right when it needed to so whatever you've heard about it it's it has not been overhyped to my knowledge i don't think i'm overhyping it here but it is wonderful and not everybody has apple tv plus now that all the episodes are dropped you can get through it in a week um so if you do want to do it and then get back out before they charge you it is worth your time but would also be worth your money if you chose to pay for it there you go. And that's, I mean, there are so few Apple TV Plus shows that I've heard actually good things about. So it's nice to hear something like that. Yeah, it's uh, fantastic. Just so much fun. And you don't need to understand soccer to get it. Ted doesn't understand it and it still works. <laughs> nice. Um, sp- on the overhyped tip, I will say that my number one is The Queen's Gambit on Netflix. And it has been, I think, I'm not going to say it's overhyped. I think it's adequately hyped. It has definitely gotten a lot of praise. Um, I believe it is Netflix's most watched miniseries now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I went into it at first. Uh, the preview came on and my boyfriend, sorry, Ryan, I'm sorry to blow up your spot like this. <laughs> Let's watch the print trailer. He's like, okay, girl in the 1950s trying to deal with the male dominated world of chess got it thanks moving on um i (laughs) saw everyone talking about it and how much they loved it i was like let me give this a shot and it is so much more than that um it is first of all i just want to say what an incredible year for anya taylor joy and Mm, i know that 
the new mutants film did not uh, land the way the people were hoping to. Kevin has a lot of opinions on it. Uh, um, we knew that wasn't but, gonna land. Yep, they were they were hiding it. We there was knew. a reason. Guys, guys, Eric liked it. So I liked um, it. And I'm good. I stand by that because those are some of my favorite characters from when I was a kid. And I actually thought that they brought those characters to life mostly accurately. Um, But she was actually quite a good magic. I don't imagine anybody else playing that role better than she could. And she's resplendent in this. She's terrific. Um, It is actually a very interesting story that's about really um, addiction. It's about mental abuse it's about classism it's about sexism it's about so much more it's even frankly political when you get to the later episodes and she's on the international stage um they made chess riveting um both in the early episodes when she's through a drug-induced stupor like actually manifesting the the chessboard on the ceiling and and playing through the games that's super interesting but then later in the competitive scenes similarly interesting um i loved it and i i do think it is stronger in the front half than it is in the back half but it is a very good miniseries it's engrossing it's gorgeous her clothes her home furnishings all of it 100 percent life goals um and she's great so if you if you have heard of the queen's gambit and you're like i don't know if it's for me i highly recommend it the first couple episodes really start with a bang and um it it cruises from there on out and that is my number one pick for the year can i pass it can i say a shout out also to marielle heller who plays her her uh adopted mother oh so Um, good she is one of the best film directors currently working she did she directed can you ever forgive me with melissa mccarthy uh uh won't you be my neighbor uh with the tom hanks mr rogers movie and Mm -hmm. uh uh what is it with Belle Pally, Diary of a Teenage Girl? Is yes. That what it's- yes. Yeah. All three literally brilliant, brilliant, brilliant films. Uh, and she's a great, now a great actress too. She is incredible. Yeah. And when I fir- they first introduced that character, you're not really sure what direction that's going to go. It's yep. like you're very hesitant and as is uh, Anya Taylor-Joy's character. And um, I, I actually really loved the dynamic that the two of them had, especially when you consider what the dynamic was with her actual birth mother. There's a lot of layers to that show and I, I really loved it. So, uh, Kate, I'm going to pass it off to you for your number one pick. My number one pick of the year, speaking of ethical quandaries, is The Vow. And I spent a lot of 2020 (laughs) watching, (laughs) as I said before, sort of watching things that are either uh, documentaries, true crime stories, things that are based on real people, real places, sort of trying to, I I don't know, just something about the tension between the real and perception was very compelling to me this year. So I like cults. Like I just do. I find, I mean, I don't like them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she loves him. he's got her six yeah like there's some there's something about me like constitutionally guys kate's, oh, guys, kate's open to joining so if you're listening and you I mean, oh, it really is will join. like the only thing that keeps me from joining cults because i am like i'm very uh like if you have a mission and i believe in it like i'm very susceptible to that but also i just don't like being around too many people so like that keeps me mm. away from cults um that is the trade-off it is the trade-off so yeah. or, like i don't like crowds um so anyway, I some of the other true crime things that I watched this year that were really good, like I'll Be Gone in the Dark or um, The Most Dangerous Animal of All, I think is what it's called. But this one, you know, it is a documentary about Nixium, which is a modern 21st century cult that is based, of course, on a multi-level marketing scheme. <laughs> and what they are selling is self-improvement, self-enlightenment, professional success. Um, there's an absolutely spectacular uh, essay that I read. And of course, I'm terrible. I don't remember what it was exactly, but it was talking about the ways that the structure of uh, Nixium's programs was very much, a, excuse me, like the uh, corporate white feminism lean in sort of like ethos. <laughs> and like, there's something very toxic about that. Anyway, I find that fascinating. But like Nixium, I spent a lot of time paying attention to it this year. The documentary goes on too long, like many documentaries. It almost feels like some new kind of reality show right it's i think um katherine van arendonk um disclosure i know her that's also a humble brag <laughs> she yeah she wrote a piece in vulture about how this represents a new sort of like 
space in um, true documentary things where it's like a prestige reality show, right? It has all yeah. of the sort of formal trappings that we expect from prestige television. But at heart, the beats of it are very real housewives in some ways. And so like what stands out to me the most as I watched this show that is interviews and crazy access to people who defected from this cult, um, it's sort of tracks Catherine Oxenberg's, um, who is on Dallas. Her, her daughter is in it, and it sort of follows her. Dynasty. Dynasty. Excuse oh, I'm me, so sorry. I'm so sorry. How <laughs> dare you? This was not the place to misstep on that. No, Kate, it was not. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Man. Wow. Okay. Anyway, she's trying to get her daughter out of the cult. Yeah. <laughs> um. So it's it's kind of about, and it's about like getting shining a light on this cult. But as the show goes on, I found myself increasingly frustrated and aware of the documentarians complete, like they are, they are too close to this. Like they are, there is no reserve uh -huh. or no remove. They are centering white male pain and like a story that like Ugh. explicitly like, like, uh, it forces women into sexual slavery. And like, by the time you get to the end of it and the very last episode, spoiler, I don't care. They're like, Ooh, season two, we're going to talk to the man at the head of the pyramid, Keith Raniere. And I was like, fuck you show. <laughs> that was literally my response. Yeah. I literally said, fuck you. HBO. Yeah, no, I'm not doing it. I mean, and, and it just was just such a weird, compelling, like, I understand why they did that. Right. They wanted to show how, intelligent, creative, um, like compassionate people could fall for this and could get sucked into it by like getting the audience sucked into it. But that is wildly ethically dubious. In yeah, my I'm, not, I'm not super interested in being like, but let's hear why he did exactly. it. Exactly. Like, I don't care why. Exactly. And we shouldn't give airtime as to why. The why doesn't matter. Exactly. So, and I feel like in the way that the show came out, um, in the timing of his sentencing in real life, I already got the like the finale in the real world that like the show would never give me. So, but it was such right. a singular wild, weird 2020 kind of show in uh, the ways that reality, and it's about the ways that reality and narratives are twisted and controlled and used to influence people. So that's my number one. <laughs> I have so many thoughts about this show and they're very intense Ooh. and Kevin also has them. Yes. Yep. Um, and we're running way long, I know. so I can't go into them. <laughs> but I will say that um, there are some really great parts about The Vow. It was very, very watchable, at least for the first like three or four episodes. That's it was all I could make through. That's all I couldn't. I when the, at the end of the third episode, I sensed the tonal shift, and I was like, "Nope, I'm out." Mm. Bye. Did you watch it, Ama? I did not. I listened to, I want to say the dream, like between seasons one and two, the first season being primarily fixated on like multi-level marketing schemes mm. and the second on like wellness scams. They had a bridge pair of episodes about Nexium, So I know the story, but I didn't watch the vow. Um, yeah. I was just curious if you, if you had any other thoughts on it. Um, as I said, there's so many thoughts on this show. We could do an entire podcast just based on yeah. this. Um, I will agree with Kate that there are elements of it. It almost made my top 10, but there are like as has, has incredible highs. It has incredible lows. And I do find that I agree that this is a new kind of reality mm -hmm. documentary sub genre. I'm not sure that's a good yep. thing because mm, I agree. Yep, you that's a great point. Out, the, the do documentarians had a vested interest in this subject that is not made clear to you in the beginning. And I have real ethical objections to it being kind of put out as we're telling this story, but you're not telling the story. You're telling a very specific version yes, of the story yes. that served one of your cast members. Mm -hmm. And you don't disclose that upfront. The, the fixation on Mark and to me, and I'm sorry, I've said I wasn't going to be negative, <laughs> but the scene where he's with Catherine Oxenberg and his wife, and he's talking about how he used to make his wife sleep on a dog bed in the room to punish her. And his response to that is to be, oh, God, I'm so terrible, and you must forgive me. And, and like, you're not even caring about the actual victim in the situation. Now you're the victim? What? You're a monster. Mm -hmm. And so I think they wanted us to feel like, oh, Mark's a good guy. Mark is not Mark a is good not guy, ladies and gentlemen. No, he's not. 
podcast. Mark is exactly the type of guy who would have gone into this thing for exactly what he says he didn't know it was about. Um, I have issues, but we're getting off track <laughs> and we were running long. We um, love to hear you talk about this on our social media when this episode drops. Ke- uh, Kevin, take us home. Your final show of the season, uh, uh, or excuse me, best show of 2020. And um, we're going to have to keep it brief because we are way over. <laughs> yep. Um, I will attempt. Um, I may just, my, so my my favorite show or the best show of 2020 for me was I May Destroy You. Mm. Um, that show so um, is perfect. <laughs> It's perfect. Um, you know, Michaela Cole, what she does in in 12 episodes uh, around sexual assault and um, the the way it's explored, um, you know, between that and Unbelievable and a couple other series and films, we're seeing these like really interesting explorations of consent and relationships and what this means. And but what Michaela Cole does in this series is she kind of expands it to be about more than her and, and the experiences that other folks have around um, around assault. And it's if you'll notice, obviously, my shows, the, there's a heavy trend of heaviness in them. Um, but, you know, for me, this show, it was it was it was also hard to watch, too, um, you know, and I don't really want to get that personal. It was a show where I had to come to terms with my own experiences and and what, what does it mean and how do I engage in, you know, making sure that, you know, I am not a big, uh, I can, I'm not someone who experiences this, nor do I perpetuate an experience for someone Mm. like this. And I think that's what really makes this the best show of 2020, because it really shines a light on, everyday life and things that we do and the things that we experience and how we engage in, in a, in a healthy sexual practice as an adult. Um, it's also very funny too. Like it has that tinge of like the sharp British humor. That's really fantastic and needed to balance out, um, the show. Um, Michaela Cole is, um, she also did chewing gum, um, Mm -hmm. which is a great show as well. Um, but, you know, she's got such a singular voice. And I, I really love what she brought to both the writing and the direction of this series. And then the, the characters, the other side characters that you get to explore, um, like Kwame, um, are really interesting. I I will spoil this a little bit. There's an episode where, where he kind of explores his own identity and he goes on a date with a woman and he doesn't disclose that he's gay to her. And... Um, it, things happen and and the story takes a very interesting turn around assault in a different way that I, th- I don't think some folks had maybe even I even myself had even thought of and it just propagates a lot of very fascinating aspects of what that means and the last episode of this um I believe it's going to be a limited series um is is a f- fucking great episode of television probably I don't know that it's my best episode of 2020, but it easily in my top five, it's utterly fucking brilliant. It's so interesting in the way it explores how you come to terms with being a, a survivor of sexual assault. Um, and there is a, a fascinating, you know, exploration in different avenues, but uh, again, a show that I would say has many, many trigger warnings. So mm-hmm. uh, if you are a survivor or if this is a topic that kind of is a little bit sensitive for you, um, you know, go in knowing that and take your time with it. I know for me, I watched in batches and I I, I stepped away from the show because I needed that for my own mental health around it. But in that, even in that it is one of the strongest and best pieces of television of 2020. Okay. Did anyone else have any thoughts on I May Destroy You or? It's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that. That's a great summation. All right. I love so it. that's it, folks. Those are our picks. Did you watch any of them? Do you have opinions? Is there something else that we missed? This episode is just the beginning of the discussion. So let us know your favorites on social media and greatpopculturedebate.com. And you better buckle up because the Great Pop Culture Debate has plenty more in store for you in 2021. Come right back to our website after the new year as the polls for season three will open up for your votes. We're talking best movie musical, best one hit wonder, best Ben and Jerry's flavor, and best Muppet just to name a few. 
Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or Audible, and that you follow us on all of our social media accounts for the latest news and updates. And if you have not yet supported us on Patreon or Pod Hero, what are you waiting for? There are so many great perks, and we would love to have you as part of our little pod family. So thank you for listening this year, and let's look forward to an even bigger and hopefully brighter 2021. Thank you so much.